So in the build-up to the Brazilian Grand Prix, I've travelled to Australia, as one does, typically, uh, mainly because this is a big weekend too for Alex Peroni. You'll remember he's the young Australian driver that had that huge shunt at Monza in the Formula 3 race, somersaulted over, over and over and over onto a tyre barrier after hitting a sausage kerb at the wrong angle and the wrong speed. And uh, he's now, I'm very pleased to say, going to have his back brace off early December and I've come over here because I just felt that it was, I don't know, dare I say important to try and get behind a guy who's going to put the budget together to race Formula 3 again next year. It's not easy for any young driver to raise that sort of money and so uh, here I am. It was a good excuse to come to Tasmania as well, I've got to say. So inevitably we're at the uh, Country Club Hotel, the famous pub on the corner of the Longford Circuit, the Tasman Circuit, and held many international races in the 50s, right through to 1968. Uh, right here, Jim Clark would have driven his Lotus 49, his Lotus 33, his Lotus 32, his Lotus 39, Jackie Stewart and the BRM. They would have come down that bit of road behind me there over the slight hump, braked for this right-hander here, pub corner it used to be called. And uh, famously, this is where Lex Davison crashed once and went in and had a beer while they were waiting to finish the race and uh, tow his car away. So they would have accelerated out of this corner onto the main, uh, onto, onto, the, onto the back straight there in effect, short back straight over a railway line, very bumpy railway line where they used to get airborne, and then out towards the Long Bridge and the famous uh, mile, which was the flying mile. Chris Amon, I think, actually holds the record there, over 190 miles an hour in the 68 Ferrari 330 P4 Spider. Frank Maddich not far behind him. The, the sports cars then, the four and a half litre, five litre sports cars, were much quicker in a straight line, of course, than the Tasman cars, which effectively Formula One. Anyway, great place just to be talking about motor racing in general and the upcoming Brazilian Grand Prix. Uh, of course, all the championships are won, so there'll be a bit of uh, talk about who's going to finish second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. and travel money that comes from the constructors points, etc. etc. For me, the most interesting thing from here on in is how Lewis is going to work on his plan for next year to beat Botas because Valtteri is driving so well right now, he won't be thinking the uh, next year's championship if the Mercedes is a championship winning car is a given at all. And so he'll be, it'll be interesting to see what uh, what he works on. Uh, this year he's clearly been better with time management during the race and we've seen that with some of the one-stop strategies, Mexico and to some extent uh, Austin classic examples. But uh, he will be thinking a little bit about Suzuka and what went wrong there. Bottom line is he got out qualified by Valtteri and I suspect that's an area where Lewis will be digging a bit deeper now to see what he can do in qualifying. Uh, I think the other key issue in Brazil is going to be how Ferrari going to go. I said after Austin that I think we should reserve judgment. I don't normally like to sort of just not make a, <laughs> an opinion, about, give an opinion about something straight up. But I think on this case, in all fairness to Ferrari, uh, Charles was running the older engine and never got the tyres to work. And that's not a cop-out answer because McLaren didn't get the tyres to work either. It's interesting, isn't it, looking back at Austin, that for the first time this year, neither Ferrari nor McLaren got the tyres to work. A couple of other teams did, notably Renault, for example. So there's an interesting thing there, isn't it? Quite sure what it is, maybe to do with rake. But then again, uh, Max was very good in the Red Bull, so it probably wasn't that. But those two teams didn't get the tyres to work, and Ferrari, I think, were... Um, struggling with Charles very early on and Sebastian as we know nearly got the pole so it didn't hurt him that much and then beyond that uh, it looks like the suspension was fractured even as he went on the grid probably did something on the outlap that he shouldn't have done so let's wait and see how they go in Brazil before we really start saying that the revised fuel flow regs have really hurt Ferrari and they've been running differently to everybody else so far this year so that'll be the fascinating thing for me in Brazil. Lots to talk about the new plan for the future to go to carbon zero and all that stuff. I'm a lot more people are in, more intelligent than I. I don't really understand all that stuff. I'm sure it's really good. I, I know it's really good for the world and the uh, uh, and the environment. That's wonderful to see. 
My view is that we can start right now rather than wait till whatever it is, another 10 years or whatever, um, because we should get rid of all those ridiculous motorhomes they have in the Formula One paddock and the carbon footprint that they're leaving at the moment. All the trucks needed to carry those things around Europe, fly them everywhere. What a ridiculous thing. So there's an easy thing to start with. Let's just have simple basic officers of the type they use when they're at the flyaway races. We don't need those lavish motorhomes. They're a bad advertisement for Formula One. If they want Formula One to go environmentally friendly and look as if we're saving the planet, let's start now. Very simple. That's, that's one thing. A couple of other things, just while I'm on it there, and I know that some people will switch off here because I'm not talking about motor racing at all, but there's two things that get to me when we're talking about things we can do to improve our world. And one of them is this ridiculous thing where it's almost default now. When you buy a banana in a grocery store, they give you a receipt for it or a box of cornflakes. What is all this receipt business? Where did it come from? How many trees have been cut down with these receipts? Can we now, please, from now on, make the default, no receipt at all, unless somebody asks for it, and then somebody can either write one out or where you can do a printout. Now, some of the supermarkets, the big ones, are fine. You know, they say, do you want a receipt? No, we don't. But generally speaking, you go to a news agent, you buy a newspaper, you get a receipt, you get a bit of paper. Let's stop all that. And the other thing, and I've talked to quite a lot of people about this, and they think I'm correct. I'm going to walk down towards this bit of road here because there's a bit of history that I'm going to tell you about. Um, the other thing is duty-free stores. What are we doing buying all that stuff before we get on the plane? Glass bottles full of fluid, all heavy, Imagine the amount of extra weight in the course of a year throughout the world that aircraft carry with all that duty-free stuff they have. It's incredibly windy here, so apologies if it's affecting the audio. I'm trying to do my best. Um, imagine all the weight, and that's ludicrous as well. So what they should do, in my view, is keep all the duty-free stores, reroute all the airports, and you only buy your duty-free when you land, not when you take off. And that would save a lot in terms of weight, save a lot in terms of fuel. Can we do that as well, please? Anyway. <laughs> Getting back to other matters, um, I've spent a bit of time here looking again at the S5000 series they're going to be running in Australia next year. They're going to, they've got another demo race this weekend in Adelaide, or near Adelaide. They've had one already in Sandown Park. It's a great car. It's a sort of modern Formula 5000 car. It's a big V8 engine in the back of basically a Ligier Formula 3 chassis with the halo and everything else. And they've done all the mods here, Gary Rogers uh, doing all of that, doing it really well. And I think it's a rorty, snorty racing car that certainly will go down quite well here in Australia. And I think as one of the, you know, as a noisy single-seater championship with a big engine, I think it'll get some attraction from overseas. There was a press release put out two days ago by the series saying that they are talking to Fernando Alonso, Nico Rosberg, Jensen Button, to do maybe a race at Bathurst in this series. And there's a round at the Australian Grand Prix as well. I doubt, you know, they'll do it myself. Maybe Fernando, actually. That's the sort of thing Fernando Alonso would enjoy doing and probably wouldn't charge too much money for. The others would probably be too expensive and I can't imagine they'll do it. But it's a good series. And I was very impressed with Chris Lambden, who's a really cool guy. Here's a picture of him. Uh, met up with him, had lunch. He is, um, you know, he's one, he's a true racer, Chris. He used to be a really, really good kart racer, uh, won the New Zealand Championship, came to Europe, didn't do that well, and then for a year, I think Martin Hines set him up, he worked as Terry Fullerton's mechanic in the World Championship karting. And guess who the big rival was that year? Etten Senna, that's right. So he lived right through that Terry Fullerton year, so we had a lot of chats about that and how good Terry was and how irritated Etten was that he couldn't really get near Terry. And that's something Etten Senna's always admitted. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that Chris, in the last race, was given a third cart. It was at Sugo in Japan. I'm going to nestle up against this wall to see if it's any less windy. Hopefully it is. Um, was given a third cart. I'm going to turn around too because there's a much nicer view behind me. There we go. Um, at Sugo. And it was wet. And he outqualified Ayrton. I said, there's a picture of him, the three of them. I said, Chris, can I please put this picture out? And he said, no, 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 no. I wouldn't want people to start talking about that. No, 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 no. And he's such a nice guy. And who knows, uh, it could well become a series that finds its niche because it's noisy and it's a great, big, nice racing car. That's one thing we did. And now behind me, I need to talk about this. This is um, down by where you see that sort of railway bridge there. 
That is effectively where the viaduct at Longford used to be. And you see some great pictures overhead shots they used to get of the, of the drivers going through the viaduct. We're talking all Formula One drivers and all Formula One cars here. And this section behind me is the approach after the viaduct to obviously the last corner, that pub corner. And very sadly, that is basically where Timmy Mayer lost his life in 1964 in the second Bruce McLaren Works Cooper. Timmy, the um, grand uncle of Timothy Mayer, who you often see as one of the race stewards in Formula One, uh, really, really talented American driver. Uh, it was the afternoon session. He'd been pretty quick in the morning and he was just trying a bit. Just went, uh, there was a hump there. I don't, know if, I don't think it was this hump on which I'm actually standing right now. I think it was a little bit down towards the trees, but there is a pronounced hump here. So it might well have been this, but I got a feeling the trees were sort of over here Anyway, the, the Cooper came down slightly sideways and he lost it and went off into the trees and he was thrown out and very sadly he died. That was 64. And then unspeakably, tragically, 65 here at Longford, Rocky Tresice was killed off the line, also in a Cooper, in a low line Cooper. Uh, he lost it off the line and went off and killed a very, very good photographer called Robin Dabrera, who was a, a photographer for Sports Car World at the time. A very good friend of Nigel Snowden, actually, who went on to be very successful in Formula One. Robin was in that sort of level and standard. And the, and, and the tragedy of that was that in 65, when that accident had happened, it was one week after the Sandown Park Tasman race, and Lex Davison in the Brabham had been killed in practice for that 64, 65 Tasman race at Sandown. And Lex Davison was the mentor of Rocky Tresice. And Rocky was driving for Lex's team. And after that accident at Sandown, which is the home circuit of Lex, there was a big, obviously a big discussion about whether they would, Rocky would do the last race here at Longford. And in the end, they decided that he would do it because that's what Lex would want. And uh, he died off the line at the start. And he was near John Yule on the grid. Now, John Yule was a very talented, very stylish, very fast Tasmanian driver who lived had a, had a sheep farm very near here, near Simmons Plains. And he, uh, I met him a, a, a while ago. I came to Longford uh, with Jeff Harris, actually, an Australian uh, former media director of the Australian Grand Prix. We came for the day. And after coming to Longford here, we went to John Yule's farm and John was there and we had a chat and I said to John do you remember that accident with Rocky and he said oh yeah I was virtually alongside him on the grid and I looked across at Rocky and he shouldn't have been in the race he was you could just see he was shaking his hands were shaking his eyes were, were as big as saucers he didn't want to be there and he just lost it wheel spin got the thing sideways went off on the grass and into the uh, into the photographers and it was a terrible thing having said all of that you know there's some great moments at Longford and this is where Piers Courage, of course, won the last big international in 68. This race, this circuit put Piers on the map. He won in the wet in the little McLaren M4A. Beautiful drive. We'd done lots. Admittedly, the Firestones were hopeless that day. Uh, Jimmy Clark and Graham Hill in the Lotus 49s were... Jimmy was on the pole. Graham won the preliminary race. But in the wet, both of them went backwards through the field. And Pedro Rodriguez was also very quick that day in the wet in 68. Anyway, this is... It's a lovely place to be, Longford. There's so much history here. And when you think, just look at that behind me. That is where they raced Formula, effectively Formula One cars. Jack Brabham, Jackie Stewart, Bruce McLaren, Phil Hill, Jim Clark, Graham. Yeah, it just, it was, so it went on, just amazing. And going back to the 50s, Stan Jones, of course. And I'm, it's actually Stan Jones's autograph. Look at that, in the pub here. The other thing I've done, two other things. We went to the uh, Dutton's classic car showroom in Melbourne which is amazing, lovely stuff. It's got a Joe Macari of, it's very, very windy again. I'm gonna go back to the shelter. Joe Macari of Melbourne, more, it's just superb actually. All the little details as well. And, um, but one of the nice things there was catching up with Gary Woodward, who was uh, on Nigel's car in 92 when we won the world championship. And I got a lot of time for Gary, brilliant mechanic. And here he is working at Dutton's, currently working on a 962, but he built this very nice uh, X80 Chiva Arrows BMW Turbo, and there's a, an X Tyrrell Cooper next to it, which is also built up, just superb stuff. And Dutton's very, very impressive. Um, and then on to this little gem. This is a gentleman called Chaz Kelly, who's in the shipping business. 
but look at this Aladdin's cave. Isn't that amazing? He's massively into sprint and midget cars, as you can see. Uh, his heroes are, well, two of his heroes are Jim Clark and Rick Mears. And so there's Jimmy's Lotus 39 from the 66 Tasman series. That's where it's living now. Doesn't it look beautiful? Here's an amazing thing. This is a letter that Jim Clark wrote. I don't think Jimmy actually wrote it. It was probably written by his manager at the time to somebody. I'm not exactly sure who. Somebody to get support for a new Jim Clark driving shoe that was coming out. And look at Jimmy's letter saying that he is very pleased to see that the grip and the sole had been done in conjunction with Pirelli. So although Jimmy spent all his career racing on either Dunlop, Firestone, and a little bit, not racing, but he drove on Goodyear's a little bit uh, testing. Here we are, Jim Clark, with a Pirelli link. I bet Pirelli don't know about that. They should use this. This is, this is huge, I think. Uh, and there's um, also Chaz owns. This is a Jim Clark original Dunlop race suit, two-part race suit, which Jimmy used obviously throughout 65 when he was on the Dunlop. 66, uh, Lotus switched, switched to Firestones. But the first couple of Tasman races in New Zealand, Jimmy still wore the blue Dunlop overalls and put, you can see the stitching here, he had the Firestone logo sewn over the top of the Dunlop. By the time they got to Australia, Jimmy had the proper silver white Firestone overalls that he used at Indy. And so we never saw that in Australia, but that's what he did in New Zealand. And amazing to see uh, that he did that. And, and uh, Chaz has now got those overalls. Uh, lots of lovely things in this showroom, just an amazing place. And finally, um, you know, we're just, I mean, flat out working as much as I can to try and help Alex with, uh, with fundraising. And um, it's gonna be happening tomorrow night in Hobart. 320 people now paying to come to the big fundraiser with the dinner. And we've got quite a lot of memorabilia, quite a lot of stuff to be auctioned. I don't know if memorabilia is the right word, but in Austin, I managed to get Max Verstappen, Kimi, Lewis, and Daniel Ricciardo to do some really nice stuff for, for the auction, which is very kind of them. And they were all spontaneous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, we'll support it which is brilliant to see, I think, the Formula One drivers supporting a young guy who had that ridiculous accident that should never have happened over that sausage curb. Um, so I'll give you a report on how that went. It's gonna be a lot of fun, I think, but here's the, the amazing amount of publicity he's been getting in his hometown. Okay, Tasmania, Hobart's a relatively small place, but in a way, that's a really good thing for a race driver because it's still big, big enough to raise money, but it's small enough to be able to galvanize the media. And, uh, here we are showing off some of the stuff for the auction. Uh, you see a nice bottle of wine there, which has been uh, donated by the CEO of Ferrari, Louis Camilleri. Very nice too, with a nice get well message to Alex on there. Uh, so that's Ferrari's contribution as well. And there were four free-to-air network broadcast TV crews turned up to interview Alex and uh, to talk about it and to promote it, basically. So it's, it's, it's got that nice homey feel to it and we'll see how it goes. You know, it's very difficult in this motor racing world in which we live these days to raise money, whether it be sponsorship, whether it be for young drivers, whatever it is. Uh, and so, you know, everybody needs as much help as they can get, I can think. I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to play much of a role, but uh, just to kind of be here and maybe just to be uh, you know a bit of moral support is what's what's uh, about all i could do but let's hope it goes quite well for him so we'll be doing some stuff over the weekend when we have a look at what's happened in brazil the big question is really where are ferrari going to be